When should you sell your cryptocurrency? This is the question that's on everybody's mind because they're looking around trying to time the market perfectly so they can walk away with sick gains. And for a lot of people, this is literally the million dollar question. And in this video, I'm going to talk about how I'm personally formulating an exit strategy from the crypto markets and how you can create a plan yourself. I'm going to talk about this as a blockchain developer who works this technology on a daily basis and has been invested in this space for years, you know, watched it like a hawk. So before we get into that, you know, if you're new around here, hey, I'm Gregory and on this channel, I turn you into a blockchain master. So if that's something that you're interested in, then smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm and subscribe to this channel. And if you want to learn how to become a blockchain master step-by-step -step start to finish, then head on over to adaptuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp to get started today. And last but not least, I hate these disclaimers, but this is not financial advice. This is for educational purposes only. I'm going to show you how you can create a plan for yourself, not tell you exactly what to do. And there's lots of scammers impersonating me down in the comment section below. Just ignore them. I'll never give you my phone number or ask you to invest with me. So when should you sell your crypto? Well, like all complicated things in life, the answer is it depends. When did you buy? Two years ago, five years ago, last week? How much do you have? You know, $1,000, $100,000, $5 million or more? What percentage of your net worth is in crypto? 1%, 10%, 100%? All these are huge factors. So instead of giving you a concrete step-by-step -step plan or a one-size-fits-all strategy that everybody can follow to a T, like saying, okay, Bitcoin's going to hit this exact price on this date, just sell when it gets there. That's not really how it works. I want to help you understand how I formulate my personal strategies so that you can create one for yourself. It's so like the old saying goes, you know, give a man a fish, feed him for a day or teach a man to fish and he eats for life. So the same is true here, but everybody's got a different situation. You might have already gotten a thousand percent return on a hundred dollar portfolio, but you might not care about selling at that point. But somebody else who got a 2x on, you know, a five million dollar portfolio, and that's like all their net worth, probably wants to take some money off the table. So there's a huge range in crypto. Everybody's situation is different. And so I want to give you some of the top characteristics of what a good plan looks like so that you can create one for yourself. And this is the thought process that I personally use to formulate my own exit strategy. So I'm going to give you those tips first, and then I'm actually going to walk you through step by step step how I'm thinking about exiting these markets. So the first characteristic of a good plan is that it deals with probability and likelihood. So, you know, nobody can predict their future perfectly, regardless of what anybody out there on the internet tells you. Like, nobody has a crystal ball to exactly know when this run's going to end and what price point it's going to reach. But that being said, even if you don't perfectly know what the future holds, you still have to try to the best of your ability to kind of see where it's going, okay? And then deal with that improbability. So you say, well, this is what's likely to happen, but I'm going to be prepared for what happens if that doesn't happen. Because we have, you know, graphs, charts, models based upon past history. And it's okay to start with the assumption that history will somewhat be an indication of what's going to happen in the future, but always be open to the fact that it won't always work exactly like last time. And if that's true, then some of these, you know, models just won't even be correct this time around. But it's good to start with assumptions and then, you know, revise your plan if those assumptions are wrong. So let me give you an example. You know, one major assumption about this crypto market cycle is that it's going to be a boom and bust cycle a lot like the last runs. So like 2017, for example, where, you know, Bitcoin rose up to $20,000 really fast and then crashed down into a multi-year bear market after that. So my personal plan is going with that assumption that it will probably happen that way again, but being open to the fact that it may not. So I'll talk later in this video about what I would do if that didn't happen and give you some examples. But that's one example of saying this is what's likely to happen in the future. So I can start building a bigger plan on top of that. So the next characteristic of a good plan is that it tries to read the market. So there's lots of different tools that you can do to try to read the market. You know, you could use advanced technical analysis, all that kind of stuff. There's plenty of great channels out there that tell you how to do that kind of thing. You can look at on-chain metrics uh, like Glassnode, for example. You can look at net unrealized profit loss which tries to determine like, is the market going to euphoria? Okay, so euphoria there is the key that to me would signal a probably a long-term market top that I would want to exit at least some of my portfolio from. So you can use a number of indicators to predict this, but without getting into a bunch of fancy tools, you can kind of just use common sense and look at the price action. Like you can zoom out here and look at, you know, 180 days. This is a really fast uh, you know, rise, but it doesn't look like a crazy blow off top or anything like that. You know, we're talking about in a minute how, you know, our assumptions could be invalid and hey, maybe we don't actually get a parabolic blow off top this cycle like we did in the previous cycles. But if we're going what I was talking about a minute ago and just starting off with assumptions, you know, what would a parabolic blow off top look like? Well, this is a much better example, okay, where you see this slower rise 
and then boom, and just see a vertical wall here. So you don't really need super fancy indicators to see that, hey, this is probably a top when you're going straight up like this in a relatively short amount of time. And that's the key here, the speed, the speed at which the market is moving you know, vertically. So when you're formulating a plan that tries to read the market, you really want to watch out for the speed at which the price moves. And if it's going really fast, then that may be a time for you to take some money off the table. At least that's how I'm personally thinking about it. Like I said, not financial advice, but that's what I look at. So next, a really good plan changes based on new information. So the whole thing here is you start with assumptions, but new information might come onto the scene that changes everything, okay? You know, if you're looking at current prices, what if, you know, the correction that we're in right now, you know, went way down? What if we went to here? Or what if we went to here? Well, you know, we were assuming that the bull market is continuing based on all the information that I talked about, those assumptions, but if we saw a candle that took us all the way down to this price level, that's probably a pretty good clue that our assumptions were invalid and that, hey, you know, it's time to start thinking about taking some money off the table. At least that's how I would personally look at this. So my plan would be revised based on that new information. And so what caused this? Like, what could be some factors that come in and validate our initial thesis? Well, don't forget, you know, crypto is not in isolation. We have the stock market. We have, you know, an entire global economy outside of this, this crypto space. And if something major happened in the overall economy, then crypto could definitely go down with it. And let's say something major happened in the overall economy when crypto is in an already vulnerable spot, maybe when it's really propped up by leverage, or maybe we've already seen a dip, then the correction could be really nasty and in the party earlier than a lot of people could think. But by the same token, the opposite could be true. Okay, maybe our assumptions are invalid. And we see the overall crypto markets enter into a super cycle that, you know, graduates from this boom and bust cycle, and we go up for a lot longer than people are thinking, and it's a lot slower. So what are some things you can look out for there? Well, like I was talking about a minute ago is really about the speed. What if we reach these price levels everybody's talking about, but it takes us a lot longer, and we don't see any kind of euphoria activity. Well, that may be an indicator that we are more of a super cycle phase rather than a boom and bust phase. And that's another example of how, you know, you could revise your plan based on new information. So the next big indicator of a great plan is that it's not perfect. It just has to be good enough. Okay, so you will never time the market perfectly. I will never time the market perfectly and sell at the exact optimum point. By the same token, you'll never buy at the exact perfect time either. You'll never maximize every dollar. So that's why a lot of people choose to dollar cost average when either they're buying in or leaving the markets. So basically the whole idea is instead of going on exchange and just clicking sell, you maybe sell a portion of the portfolio over time. And so if you think you've reached your sell place, you know, I, maybe if I think I've reached my sell place, then maybe I start selling off, you know, a quarter of the portfolio or 10% and do it in increments over time because you're never going to catch this perfect top ever. It looks so easy in hindsight, but it's incredibly set deceptive when it's happening in real time. All right. The next thing is the best exit plan actually quantifies your gains and determines like, is it worth keeping this in the market or do you want to take money off the table? And so you have to think about this. You know, not everybody's situation is different. You know, how much money have you made in total? What's your percentage ROI? So if you made, you know, 20x, 50x on some altcoins, but you only started with $100 and now you have $5,000 and you have a lot more than $5,000 sitting around in other investments or your savings, then you may not care that much about selling. Or maybe said a different way, like it's okay for you to risk that amount of money because if you lost that $5,000, it wouldn't ruin your life or rob you of the new opportunity that was becoming available now that you had this money. Now that situation may start changing if you had, you know, a hundred thousand dollars and it's now a million dollars. And let's say you had never been a millionaire before and now you are a millionaire and that's like your only hope of staying a millionaire, then it may be time to like start thinking about taking some money off the table regardless of where we are in the market cycle. Because, you know, if that's your only way of making that type of money and then you lose it all and can't get it back or you have to wait a really long time before you get it back, then it may not be worth trying to time the absolute top of the market. Sometimes it's best to just take some wins while you can. And so, like I said, that's not financial advice, but I would personally think about some of those types of things if that was the situation that I was in. And so in some of these cases, maybe you don't think about selling everything. Maybe just sell part of it. Or maybe you just take your principal out. Let's say it went up like 10x. You could just take out the original amount that you bought in with and then let the rest ride because it's like, you know, house money. All right, so next thing is the best plan determines taxes because this might affect when you sell. Okay, so you always want to check with a tax professional who understands your jurisdiction before you make any really important tax decisions. And this is not financial advice or tax advice, but you know how it works here in America is you pay different capital gains rates depending on how long you've held an asset for. So 
for me, like if I buy something and I hold it for longer than a year, then I pay less in capital gains tax than if I'd held it for a short amount of time, you know, less than a year. And so some people, this may be an incentive for them to hold longer to reap that benefit, but the crypto market moves really fast and there's risk on the table there. So you don't want to just like try to get a capital gains benefit if the market's going to drop and you're net going to lose money. The whole idea is if you wait on the tax break, does that actually net you a higher return long term? So that's the thing you have to think about when factoring in taxes. And also just the tax basics. Like, don't forget, you have to pay taxes on this stuff. And if you don't, people can definitely find you. And so another thing is, you know, some of our assumptions are invalid and we are in a, you know, super cycle. Then for some people, maybe there's a tax advantage to staking some of, if not all of your cryptocurrency. So how it currently works here in America is if you buy Bitcoin, let's just say like $10,000 and it goes to 100K, then you're only taxed whenever you sell. Okay. But if you just take the, the Bitcoin and you, let's say, stake it or you lend it out and earn interest on top of it, then you're only taxed on the interest that you're getting there. You're not actually taxed on the principal appreciation. And let's say you're a long-term holder of Bitcoin and we actually do enter into a super cycle, then you could potentially earn a passive income reward on that Bitcoin without incurring the tax burden of selling the principal itself. So that's just something to think about as well. And maybe you do that for a portion of your holdings rather than all of it if you want to take some risk off the table. So another major characteristics of a great exit plan is keeping as much emotion out of the decision as humanly possible. So this basically looks like making a plan and sticking to it. All right. So I know it's really hard to uh, make decisions very rationally without emotion. In fact, I would venture to say it's impossible to completely remove emotion from the equation because anytime you make a big, important decision that's really consequential, you're going to feel some emotions. So I'm not saying don't have emotions. You can't really control that. But what you can control, or at least you have a lot more control over, is how you respond to those things. So you can, with discipline, try to basically remove yourself from an emotional situation. And this doesn't mean you have to like go wait a week or wait a month before you make a decision. Like maybe you have a, a panic attack. And instead of like clicking the sell button right then, like maybe you're at a period where we do enter some crazy big crash where you have to change your thesis. Well, you're going to get freaked out if that happens. At least I personally know that I would. So what would I do in that case? Well, I probably just take a breather. All right, I would go outside. I would do something to try to regulate my mood as much as possible to make the most rational, clear choice. And I would probably make a plan about what I'm going to do in the future rather than right now in that moment. And whether the future is an hour from now, it's tomorrow, it's you know two days away. I would just plan it in advance and stick to it rather than just doing what I feel like in the moment. All right, so those are a bunch of different characteristics of what a good plan looks like. So... Let's kind of put all that together and talk about what I would personally do and how I use all the information that I just gave you to formulate my own plan. So this will give you a little bit of what my background looks like, what my current situation is, and how I actually put all these things into practice. So number one is I bought most of my current cryptocurrency holdings in 2020. So I've already seen quite a bit of appreciation in the market so far. You know, I didn't just get in last week. So to me, like the risk reward scenario of buying a lot more right now is a lot lower than just holding what I have. And by the same token, you know, it's a significant amount now and I don't want to just watch it drop by 90%. So how would I think about exiting the markets? Well, let's go back to what I talked about at the beginning of the video is looking at some indicators, you know, entering into a euphoric period. So part of that speed, all right. So I would, of course, look at the on-chain metrics to try to get an indicator of, you know, are we in a period of euphoria? But I also choose common sense. Like I would look at the charts and I would say, do we see some sort of big parabolic blow off top? So what would that potentially look like? Well, if we were sitting here in Bitcoin, let's say in the next 15 days, you know, Bitcoin just rocketed off past $100,000, maybe like to $110,000 next week or so, that to me would look like a euphoric blow off top, even if the on-chain metric didn't say it, which I think they probably would just from, you know, my quick assessment of that. That's when the Bitcoin price would basically double uh, from this price level that's already seen a lot of appreciation at. It would just look like a big parabolic blow off top. And I would really start thinking about taking some money off the table in that case. And in that case, I would probably try to do some dollar cost averaging out of the market rather than just selling everything all at once. And another thing to think about as we start reach approaching that number really, really fast is there are big psychological numbers at play. You know, 100K is a psychological number. I think once we get to 100K, things will get dicey. I mean, assuming that we even get there in the first place. And if we do, then it may make sense to start dollar cost averaging out before we even hit 100K, just because it's a strong psychological number that there's no guarantee that we'll even hit it in the first place. Because that's basically what happened with Bitcoin back in 2017. You know, 20K was a really strong psychological number and we never really quite even hit it on all exchanges. So what's another scenario? Well, you know, what if we're looking at like the Ether price, for example, and ETH slowly rises uh, over, you know, the next 
several months and let's say ETH slowly goes to 5K, maybe slowly goes to 10K by the end of the year and then rockets off to something like 20K. Well, that to me would look like a parabolic blow off top. I would do the same types of things that I was talking about a minute ago. But like I was saying earlier, you know, that's based on the assumption that we will continue to be in a bull market, that we will see a euphoric blow off top, and that's how it handle a scenario like a parabolic blow off top. But let's talk about some scenarios where that doesn't happen because, again, my, my plan is open to new information. If things play out differently than how we are assuming, then I'm going to adjust to those types of things and make different game time decisions based on that new information. So what if we're not in a boom and bust cycle and we're actually in a long-term super cycle? So how would I read something like this? Well, for example, what if it takes ETH all year to reach $5,000. I know people are talking about Ethereum going to 10K. Well, if ETH goes to 10K like in the next couple months, that's probably game over. But what if ETH takes all year to reach $5,000, which is just roughly 2X from here? And the Bitcoin price movement's looking about the same, like maybe it takes Bitcoin the rest of the year to reach $100,000, or maybe that takes, you know, 18 to 24 months or something like that. That's probably an indicator of a much more gradual rise in price that would make it much less likely they were actually in a boom and bust cycle with a parabolic blow off top that everybody thinks we're in. And so if that were the case, uh, you know, depending on what the price levels were, I probably wouldn't do anything. But let's just say we even got to $10,000 then maybe I would just sell like a part of that. Just try to take some money off the table, you know, realize some gains, but leave a lot more in for the long term because I don't think it's gonna just instantly dump and enter into a multi-year bear market really time soon. So another scenario is like a, a price dump. So what I was saying earlier, like what if, you know, the Bitcoin price just takes a nasty correction from here, you know, goes all the way down. Um, well, you know, that would invalidate a lot of things. Like I said, we have to look at new information. But for me personally, again, it's not financial advice for you because everybody has a different situation. At the current price level, with the current amount that I hold, I would probably just honestly hold long term because I don't really need the money that I've got in it right now. It sucked to watch it drop by 90%. But that's probably just what I would do at the current price level. Maybe I might sell a little bit off if we have like a big relief pump back to maybe 80% of the price levels before. But that's not financial advice for you. Your situation might be different. That's just how I'm thinking about it. Because again, I'm investing in other things outside of crypto. It's not my only hope. All right, and so the last thing is an actual like super, super, super nasty crash. Like what if the crypto market just defies everyone's expectations and crashes down to like, you know, I don't know, something crazy back to where we were at the beginning of the year or something like that. And it just totally invalidates everyone, everything everyone's, let's say something happens in the global economy that completely changes the game. Well, like I said a minute ago, um, you know, I probably wouldn't be selling at that point. And honestly, if that happened and I thought it was like a massive flash crash, this is just my personal take. This is not financial advice for you, but I might buy more in a situation like that, okay, just because of what I think this stuff is capable for in the long term. But I would probably only be buying really solid stuff like ETH or Bitcoin. All right, so that's an example of how I piece together all this information to actually formulate my own exit strategy. So like I said, all this stuff depends on a lot of things. This is not simple where I can just say, hey, you know, cryptocurrency is going to reach this price by this date. You know, just sit back and then just you know set your limit order to sell everything at this price target because it's going to hit here, you know, in September this year, like December this year, whatever it is, right? Nobody knows for sure. So you have to formulate your own plan based on the information that I've talked about in this video. That's an example of how I take in this type of information and use it as a framework to make my own decisions. And those are some example scenarios of how I plan to look at these markets based on what could happen. Again, the probability and, you know, changing your thesis based on new information. So last, and I, I mentioned this a little bit in this video, and I made a video about it earlier on my YouTube channel. You can check that out. The number one mistake I think a lot of people are making in crypto is relying on this about being their only hope to reach their financial goals. And like I said a minute ago, you know, I invest in other things besides crypto. I'm in real estate. You know, I'm a blockchain developer. I'm in this space, you know, earning money that way. And I think a lot of other people can change their financial future by actually just changing their job and working in the blockchain industry. I think being a blockchain developer is one of the best ways to do this. You don't really have to have a crazy technical background to learn this stuff. The demand is insanely high. And so that's something that you're really interested in. Then how could you get started today? Well, you can go to my YouTube homepage. You can find any of my free courses there. I like Udemy courses, but they're totally free. And if you like those and you went to the next step or hey, maybe you want to take a massive shortcut entirely, I can show you become a blockchain master step-by-step -step, start to finish over at dappyuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp. All right, so that's all I got for today. As always, smash that like button down below. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. Until next time, thanks for watching Dapp University.